Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Here we go. Okay. So first of all, is that pain is, is a complex sensory and emotional experience. It's not just a, a sensation. And there are actually people uh, in the world that don't perceive pain. And this guy uh, on the left, you know, he, was, he, he was in the circus. He was a human pin cushion. I don't know, did Joe show you this guy already? Oh, okay, because he's a kind of famous. But this is a very rare genetic disorder uh, that very few people have, but uh, that, that the people really don't feel pain at all. And you might think it's kind of nice not to feel pain, but the truth is that we need pain and that we actually use pain all day long, every day of our lives. We just don't think about it. It's like little pain that we use. So if I stand here and I, in one position too long, I become uncomfortable, right? So then I have to shift positions. That's pain. It's not like a big pain, but it's not, it's that discomfort is really the pain system starting to tell you that you're not comfortable. Well, these people who don't perceive pain, even as young children, they develop terrible arthritis in their knees and their hips because they don't readjust their position. So they stand in the same position too long. Or they will get abscesses, like little kids, that, you know, they, they're kneel, kneeling down playing. They don't feel the pain of too much pressure and they get abscesses on their knees. Or they, they, they chew their tongue off, you know, kids, you know, kids love to play with things, so they stick pencils through their faces. I mean, it's, it's really not a good thing. And if, obviously, if something, if they had appendicitis or something, they wouldn't know it. And so the life expectancy of somebody who doesn't feel pain is not that long. So it's a good thing, up to a certain extent. <laughs> uh, but we can see that that there is it's a lot of variability in the way we experience pain. So some people not at all. The other people, uh, like if you look on the right, you know, this kid is screaming with an injection, and not only is she screaming, but the kids behind her look like they're in pain, and they haven't even gotten to the front of the line yet. <laughs> and, uh, that, that looks like my daughter. I used to, when she was young, I used to get these calls from school, and they would find, you know, they couldn't pry her out from underneath some piece of furniture when it got to be inoculation time. So. Um, so there's, a, you know, as I said, people have these different experiences. And it's one of the reasons, okay, there are these genetic factors that lead to hypersensitivity or insensitivity to pain in some cases. And, I, and Jeff will probably be talking to you not only about sex, but also about g genetics a bit. Um, but um, that some people, that we all have within our brain mechanisms that we can use to alter pain ourselves. And some people are better at accessing these systems than others. And so this person, this picture of migraine, looks like somebody who actually is not accessing that system very well. But there are other people, like this guy who's uh, hanging from meat hooks. Now, he doesn't have congenital insensitivity to pain. He has a normal pain system. But he's just able to control his pain. So he looks perfectly content as he hangs there, and I had to cut off that picture because actually there's parts of it that were x-rated of his various piercings he had while he was dangling there from the meat hooks. But uh, so, yet, uh, so that, that, and we know from our, you know, ourselves and our friends and family that there does seem to be a range in the way we are able to control our own pain. So the way that we study that, I've been studying this for many, many years, but um, when human the human brain imaging started to be able to create very good images of what's happening in the brain in different, uh, different situations, it really allowed us to start understanding the neural basis of how we can control pain uh, through our psychological state uh, and, and how, why people experience pain differently. So the most common, there's different types of brain imaging. We use uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, Many of you probably have had MRIs, but that we have a lot of MRIs can take pictures of the anatomy, a picture of the structure, but then you can also use different settings in the machine that actually allow you to, uh, to image uh, neural processing or image changes in blood flow that happen in response to the activation of neurons. So just as when you, um, if you are using a muscle blood flows to that muscle. When you're using certain neurons in your brain, you have increased blood flow to feed those neurons. And so what you can do with MRI is you can actually uh, image changes in blood flow which can infer which parts of the brain the neurons are being activated at any given period of time. So um, 
with these types of uh, techniques, um, we've this, we, and other animal techniques and various types of things, we found that many parts of the, uh, of the brain are involved in how we feel pain, and there are other parts of the brain that are important in changing the way we feel pain. So see, I'm going to show you anatomy pictures now. So this is just a, just a drawing, but what, let me see if I can make sure that, okay. So we have down here the spinal cord, so you come, you have nerves that come in from various parts of your body, and they make connections in the spinal cord, and then they go from the spinal, then other connections then go from the spinal cord up to various parts of the brain, into the midbrain, into what we call the thalamus, and then connections go from these parts of the brains up to the somatosensory cortex, the highest parts of the brain. And you see that you actually have quite a complex circuitry of multiple pathways that are coming from the spinal cord that go to various parts of the thalamus and very part, various parts of the cortex, including parts that we know are important for, for, set, for sensation, somatosensory cortex, motor cortex, important for movement, and also think areas like the, the cingulate cortex, important for emotions, and prefrontal cortex uh, that are important for many factors of, of regulating uh, emotions and, and um, cognitive state. And we also, so we have these what we call ascending pathways that take the signal from your body up to your brain to say, okay, I'm in pain, but then we have other signals that come back down and that modulate the signals that are going up. So pain signals are going up, and then we have these other circuits that send signals down that can block, well, they can either enhance, they augment the signal, or they can block or, or, or decrease the signal uh, as it's coming up uh, into the brain. So you have this balance between the activation from the body and the modulation coming down. And as I said, there are parts of this, of this, uh, this system that's involved with pain uh, there are parts of it that we think are most important for pain sensation. That is, that if you get an injection, you feel a pricking, stinging sensation, right? And then, but then you have an emotional reaction to that sensation. And other parts of the brain uh, we find that are important for the kind of the emotional aspects of pain. So this, what we call the primary somatosensory cortex, these little colored blobs, so what we have here is a picture of a brain that, that have been taken, and when you do an MRI, you just get a three-dimensional image that you can look at in different planes. So you can just cut it this way or this way virtually, not really cutting the person's head open. That's, that's the beauty of MRI as opposed to having to cut somebody's head open. And you can look at what's happening, and these colored blobs are showing these area, uh, regions where we find that the, they're being activated by the pain, that, we, that, that the neurons are being activated by the pain. So we find that what we call the primary somatosensory cortex and what we call the secondary somatosensory cortex are activated by all different types of pain stimuli. But then we also find activations in these areas like the, the cingulate cortex and the insular cortex that are more important uh, for emotional states. And one of, we have various ways of knowing that some of these activations are related to sensation and others are re related to the emotional response. Different, type, different ways that we know that, but one way that we know that is from looking at pain perception in people that have had strokes, that have had damage to their brain. And this is an example of a, of a, um, a, a patient that had th this white glob here are areas where there's been damage to his brain. And one of these areas, this one right here, is this primary somatosensory cortex, and this area is the secondary somatosensory cortex. So these two areas have had severe damage, but these other areas, the, this, the uh, cingulate cortex and the insular cortex, are intact. And then what they did with this patient is they blindfolded him, and then they did various things. They would either pinch him, or they would brush gently, uh, or they would you know, put ice on him, or they would uh, uh, put a, something hot on him in different parts of his body. And he, could, he didn't know, he couldn't tell them where, what they were doing, where they were doing it. The only thing he would know is if he liked it or not. So things that we would call painful, all he'd go, that, I don't like that. 
something that was not painful, he wouldn't mind it. But he didn't, couldn't recognize where it was happening or exactly what was happening. So you need these somatosensory areas to distinguish the features of the pain. But, the emotion, but he had the emotions. He didn't like it. It felt bad, even though he didn't know what was happening to him that was making him feel bad. Okay, so we had pain emotion without pain sensation. Okay, so psychological factors we now are finding modulate, change the way we feel pain uh, via these pathways, these descending pathways in the brain. And, and there are different pathways that seem to be involved in different um, psychological states that can change the way we, we, we feel pain. So there's two kind of big things that we've studied that, that we look at how it changes pain. And one is the person's emotional state. And the other is his attentional state, whether or not he's distracted or not. So um, I love rock climbing. This has been my, my, one of my flaws for the last 40 years of my life. That, uh, and so this is me coming up to the top of a rock. And what, what I like about it, one thing I like about it, is it's really distracting. When I'm focusing on climbing, I don't think about anything else. And so, which is kind of nice, it takes all your worries away, and you don't think about you know, work and all these things. But I also noticed that when I'm climbing, you know, I could, I could easily, with the rough granite rock, it's very easy to scratch, to, to, to cut yourself or, or to, you know, to bruise yourself. And I could come, get up to the top of a pitch and sit down on a belay ledge, and I haven't felt a thing while I was climbing. And then I look down, and my legs are all bruised and bloody, and, and I didn't feel it. I would have felt it under other circumstances, but I'm so focused on something else that you don't feel it. And you don't have to go rock climbing to have that experience. Like if you, if you think about it, like if I'm if I'm hunched over my computer working on something, and I'm really really focused on what I'm doing, writing or whatever emailing or <laughs> Facebook or whatever people, you know, you're really thinking about what you're doing, you don't, you, you know, you're perfectly fine. And then you stop and take a break and you realize your shoulders are sore, you, you know, your back hurts, but you haven't been feeling that until you stop to think about it, right? Is that, okay. So it's really, it seems so simple, but it's so powerful. The effect of distraction is as strong, like we did studies in our laboratory, we gave people a clinical do dose of morphine and we gave them, dis and we distracted them and you get just as much pain relief by distracting the person as by giving them a clinical dose of morphine. Now, there are cases, you're not gonna, you can't use distraction for major surgery or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just think about something else, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, under, for, for small types of pain, it's quite effective. And so, uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit later, you know, how this works in the brain. But another thing that really has a big influence on pain is the emotion, is your emotional state. Now, I'm not really sure this idea that birth, giving birth, is so wonderful that it doesn't hurt. I don't know. Is that men that say that, or I don't know. It's, uh, but, but. That amount of pain, when it's something wonderful, is not as bad as that amount of pain if you have cancer, right? It's, it's, uh, it has a different feel to it. And, and, and what we will we'll show you is that, in fact, uh, your emotional state doesn't necessarily affect the pure sensation of the pain, but it, it surely affects where, how you feel about it, the emotional response to the pain. So, what, what I've kind of alluded to is that now we have evidence that emotions and attention control pain in different ways. Now, if you, this guy's, oops, this little guy's, but oops, okay, stop it. <laughs> he looks like he's, like he's definitely a candidate for chronic pain. Huh? <laughs> anyway, yeah. so, uh, and that's what I want to show you some of the, the data today, tonight. So, okay, how do, first of all, I just want to say, how do we measure pain? Because we, you know, we put people in scanners and we pinch them and poke them and we even do things like sticking balloons down their esophagus. Like, we're very mean in our lab. And, uh, uh, but in order to, to look at what's happening with pain, but we, a, we have to ask people how they feel pain. So what we do is we don't just say how much pain you feel. We try to divide it into these two dimensions, the emotional dimension and the and sensory dimension. So we give a person two scales and, and we have them 
rate how, how strong the actual sensation of the pain is and how strong, how much the pain bothers them. So something may not be that strong but bother them a lot. Another thing may be very strong but not bother them much at all. So it just, uh, you know, things like, um, like a nice deep uh, massage. You know, if you had to rate that on the pain sensation scale, you know, you might rate it like on a 100-point scale, like a deep, a deep massage. What, what kind of number on the sensation scale might you give that? Seven. Yeah, seven or eight, right? But how about on the unpleasantness scale? Oh, well, some people don't like massages. <laughs> but, but pleasantness, <laughs> you might not find it, you might actually find it pleasant, and for some people, it depends. <laughs> but a lot of people do find it pleasant, even though it, it actually hurts. Okay, so as I said, attention and emotion alter different aspects of, the, of pain. And I'm sorry, this is really not a very good picture here, it's kind of fuzzy. But using these two scales, the intensity scale and the unpleasantness scale, that when you are focusing on the pain, you're attending to the pain, you find, versus when you're distracted from the pain, you get a very big difference in the pain intensity. You get a, you get a difference from like, you know, six to eight on a, on a 10 point scale, which I said is similar to what you would get with morphine. So um, you actually get quite a diminution of the pain sensation but you get less of a change in how much it bothers you, and this is not even statistically significant. Now, on the other hand, if you, if you change a person's mood state, so you give him pain when he's in a good mood versus a bad mood, you find that how much it bothers him, how unpleasant the pain is, is higher when he's in a bad mood than a good mood, but the pain intensity is not different. He still feels the pain, equally, but he finds it more unpleasant when he's in a bad mood than when he's in a good mood. And you could probably just relate to that in your own everyday experiences. And corresponding with these differences in the way uh, emotions or attention uh, uh, alter the experience of pain, they alter the different parts of the brain uh, commensurately. So this is your somatosensory cortex, is, this blob shows activation uh, related to a pain stimulus when you're focusing on the pain. And this blue, this less bright glob, shows activation when you're distracted. And the brighter it is, the more the activation. And so you have significantly more activation in the somatosensory cortex when you're focusing on the pain than when you're distracted from the pain. Now, as I said, emotions alter how pain is processed in these limbic emotional areas. So here, this is the uh, cingulate cortex, and you see that when you have pain when the person is in a bad mood, you get a nice glob there. And when you have a pain when he's in a good mood, it doesn't even reach our, our statistical threshold, so it's so, so reduced. So you get much more activation in this, this emotional area when you give the person a pain when he's in a bad mood than a good mood. And uh, we found that basically this, there's different circuitry that is involved in with attention. Attention has been studied a lot in, in the visual modality, visual attention, and, and how that ha makes you navigate the world. Because if you couldn't focus your visual attention on objects, it would be very difficult because everything would be exactly, I would just be like another thing next to the, to the eraser and you wouldn't be able to distinguish the, the figure from the, from the background. And so it's been studied a lot and there are certain parts of the brain that they've been implicated and this superior parietal area has been implicated in visual attention and we see that it's also implicated in pain attention. So attending or, or, or you know, focusing on pain or being distracted from pain is very similar to what you have in all your sensory modalities of uh, when you're, when you're paying attention to something, whether it's uh, when, you know, like you can be hearing lots of noises in a room and, and the loudest one will draw your attention, but you have the ability to focus on what that person right behind you is whispering to his friend, even though that's not as loud as my speaking. So you're, you have the ability to change your, your, your auditory attention and the same with your visual attention. While this, uh, the, the emotional state involves a circuitry that I'm going to be coming back to because we also find that it's important for placebo 
uh, effect, placebo analgesia. And this is this area of the frontal cortex and an area that we call the periectoductal gray matter, the PAG, that, um, that is actually opiate sensitive, that when you take opiates, like what, what Joe was talking about last week, uh, they, the opiates, what they do is they bind to, part, to, to, to receptors in the brain that normally are activated uh, by normal things in your life. I mean, they're not there so that you can take drugs. They're there uh, so that you can, <laughs> that you can, you know, that, that things that are happening around you will lead to the, that, the, uh, the activation of those receptors. And so the PAG, the, these are areas that are sensitive to opiates, and I'll show you some of that more when we get to placebo. Okay, so in, in many cases, or to point out, in many cases, attention and emotions uh, are both altered, they're altered together. So if you go to the dentist and he tries to distract you with a picture, <laughs> he's not gonna just use any picture, right? <laughs> He's going to use a picture that makes you feel good. And that's where, so I mean, it's, it's important, I think, in everyday life when you're thinking about your own pain or pain if you have chronic pain problems, back problems, or fibromyalgia, or, or whatever, which many of us do, and you try to think about ways you can help yourself, uh, that making you do things that make you feel good and distract you both together. Now you have two descending modulatory systems that are working together. So it's okay to do things that distract you, that, that make you feel good. I mean, there's, there was the, this group in, in Germany have done some kind of clever things. They were looking at chronic pain patients, um, and they looked at pain patients who had, whose spouse was very solicitous and was always saying, how's your pain today? How are you doing today, honey? And then compare that to patients who had spouses that just said, I'm going to go play golf, see you later. Uh, so which ones had more pain? Yeah, the ones who's, you know, the spouses are trying to be nice, but all they're doing is helping the patient focus on the pain all the time. <laughs> but if you want to have a nice spouse that makes you feel good and feel loved, and some, but then manages to distract you instead of having you focus, and that's kind of tough. Okay, so it said, placebo analgesia. We've all heard a lot about placebo, right? Well, placebo is real. It's a real physiological mechanism. And it really takes advantage of what these types of modulatory systems in the brain have been talking about. Now, there are, there's actually two ways of creating placebo, and I'll, most, I'll talk more about expectation and conditioning, but expectation is that you go in and you have a, a nice doctor who you trust, and he gives you a medication and said, this is a great analgesic, it's gonna make your pain go away, you're gonna feel much better and you believe that person, you have a very high expectation of pain relief, and that, in fact, I'll show you, actually leads to release of chemicals in the brain and activation of descending modulatory systems that, in fact, block your pain. You're not imagining it. It's really happening in your brain, but it's happening through your expectations. That's why it's good to trust your doctor. If you don't, you're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> There's a, but interestingly, you can have conditioning even without expectation. Like if every day I give you, this is like a Pavlovian conditioning where, you know, he would ring a bell and feed the dog, you know, like I have retrievers and they love, they, they sell it when you see food and the, the drool just drips out of their mouth, you know, if you have those kind of dogs. And so if you ring a bell and then feed them, so, you know, they see the food, they, they salivate. So you ring a bell, give them, feed them every day, then you have to do is ring the bell and they start salivating. That's a classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning. Well, you can have the same thing. You could, every day, you could be taking your medication and it makes you feel better. And then one day, um, you know, you know that you're taking an expired pill and you know it's not going to, that it should be inactive, but just going through the same process and taking the pill and doing the same thing, you'll still get uh, an analgesic response through the placebo system even though you don't have the expectation. And it gets complicated in the studies of this because the mechanisms, the conditioning uh, in the brain are somewhat different than expectation, but, but they all contribute uh, towards the analgesia, you know, the pain relief. So I just want to say that, that through brain imaging, again, these, we can see uh, that the placebo medication is, in fact, reducing 
pain activation in the brain. And what this is showing is that in a, a nice study where they, where they were looking at placebo analgesia, that these red globs are showing areas where there is less pain-evoked activation when the person has the placebo uh, uh, response than when he doesn't have the placebo. Uh, placebo suggestion. So just showing that in areas that we know this, this pain activation is actually reduced uh, when the person gets the placebo. But I think more interestingly, I, I talked about this descending, oops, <laughs> descending system through the frontal, the prefrontal cortex and the PAG that involves opiates. Uh, in fact, that is activated when the person has this expectation during the placebo expectation. So it looks like the same general uh, circuitry that's activation, activated by, with, by emotions is also activated by placebo response. And as I said, there are brain chemicals that are released uh, in response to placebo. So um, I don't think I have all these slides in here, but, there's, but we know that for, with placebo analgesia, because there's placebo not just for pain relief or analgesia, you have placebo, uh, the big placebo responses for, uh, for um, depression medication, for Parkinson's medica uh, medication. You could, somebody can be, can be sitting there shaking, you give them a placebo and they stop shaking. So it's very dramatic with Parkinson's, the placebo response. But these, so it's, it makes it difficult to even start testing uh, pain relieving drugs or drugs for depression because the placebo response can be so huge, it's hard to, to separate it out from the real, the, the additional therapeutic response. But anyway, so we know now that both the opiate system and the dopamine system, and I, I have this little bone up here because that's kind of classically known as the reward uh, uh, neurotransmitter, and, and Petra Schweinhardt will be talking about the relationship between the pain system and the reward system. Uh, but both of these are actually released in the brain when you have a placebo. So it's just like if somebody gave you a shot of morphine when they give you that placebo, as far as your brain is concerned. What's nice is that you don't get all the other side effects because when you have morphine, they have effects not only in these pain centers but other parts of the brain as well as uh, on your cardio on your on your respiratory system and you know you have respiratory depression and other side effects. Constipation is a big problem with opiates. You don't have that with the placebo because you're only releasing the opiates in the parts of the brain that are important for uh, for pain. And this gets complicated data that are acquired through positon emission tomography where we inject small radioactive doses of an opiate with and without pain, with and, with and without uh, uh, placebo. But what I want to show you is here's the people's pain rate, different people's pain ratings are how much of a placebo response, a change in pain ratings, that is how much of a placebo response they had. There's a high variation in the, in, and how much of a placebo response different people have. Some people have a huge decrease. This is change in their pain ratings, so they have a huge decrease in their pain ratings. Other people don't even have any decrease in their pain ratings. They don't have any placebo effect. But if you correlate the, person, the placebo effect here with how much um, opiates are released in certain parts of the brain, like particularly the cingulate cortex and the thalamus, you find that there's a nice relationship the bigger the placebo response, the more that this neurotransmitter is released in the brain. And the same relationship uh, for dopamine uh, in parts of the brain. So you see that, that, that these, these brain chemicals are, re are released just because of your psychological state, just because of your belief and your expectation. Now, how do psychological factors affect people who care for or love somebody who's in chronic pain. How many people here have chronic pain or have a, a loved one who has chronic pain? Yeah. <laughs> this is not, I mean, you might think if they're selecting because this is a pain mini series, but in fact, that probably represents the general populace, that it's very, very prevalent. You know, 30% of people have had periods of chronic pain, and then when you talk about you know, the, your loved ones as well, it gets uh, uh, much more. So what happens? Well, you might, when you're, the, 
the lecture on, broken, on the broken heart might kind of get into some of these same factors. But what we find, or what other, this is not our, my studies, but other people have found, is that um, when you're feeling empathy towards somebody who's experiencing pain, and then you look at what's happening in your brain, you find that you get activations not in these sensory, somatosensory areas, but in these emotional areas that are, that are activated by pain themselves, by, themselves are also activated uh, when you are watching a loved one experiencing pain. So in these studies, the subject is lying in the, in the MRI scanner, and her boyfriend is getting pain in front of her, and then you're looking at, at the woman's brain. Now, the studies, and I, this first study was only female subjects, and people were asking why that was, and the people said, well, the experimenters said, well, it didn't work as well with men, because um, I think <laughs> that women, women in, in general, not all, but overall, women are more empathetic than men. So if you do across the board, now there are non-empathetic women and empathetic men, but it, so it, seems it works best. The more empathetic you are, the more these brain areas are activated when you're empathizing with somebody that you love who's experiencing pain. So in our lab, actually with Jeff Mogul too, uh, Jeff may talk to you about his empathy in rats. He has some nice studies where, where when a, a little rat is with his cage mate, somebody he's been growing up with, and that rat's in pain, then uh, they, have, uh, they have a very different reaction than when it's a strange rat in pain. So. But um, with, with Jeff, we did some studies with, with humans to say, okay, if in fact empathy, when you're, when you're feeling empathy towards uh, someone in pain, these areas that are activated by pain are, are being activated, could they be kind of primed? Could you be more sensitive to pain because of this empathetic state? So we tried to do this experiment, and what we did is we had a group of people that, first of all, we uh, had them just watch a neutral video, you know, just like sidewalks and bicycles and things, and we gave them pain while they're watching this neutral video. And then we had them um, uh, watch a video about um, uh, somebody else, and it was complicated, our, our, our ruse with all of this, but anyway, they watched a video of somebody that you, they could empathize with, or they watched a video of somebody that they couldn't empathize with. So the, the empathetic guy was telling a story about how his, he was in a car accident with his girlfriend and she died. And he was like a really nice guy and you know, they, they felt very badly. And then actually it was the same actor, but in the other, for the other group, he was telling them how he was, uh, he was able to, he thought it was very funny because he would go to the local dep and there was a blind uh, cashier and that he could actually, he could like move the money around so that he could cheat the guy out of, the, out of some of the change and he wouldn't have to pay as much and he thought that was very funny because, you know, these handicapped people, they get way too much, our government gives them so, you know, way too much and, uh, you know, uh, it, they, they deserve being ripped off and so people didn't empathize with him so much. <laughs> So we actually, when we're measuring their, their state of empathy, because you can have, we, we have what we call trait, trait empathy, that some people are just generally more empathetic than others, but you have state empathy, so that even somebody who's not particularly empathetic in general, you can put them in an empathetic state, depending upon the context, or you can put somebody who can be highly empathetic in a very unempathetic state, because, you know, the person they're, they're around is kind of a... Not a nice person. Uh, so anyway, so we did that, and then we give them pain while they're watching these, this other guy uh, that they're either empathizing with or not empathizing with, getting pain himself. It's not a very good graph, but what this is, it shows increasing temperatures. And these, these temperatures over here, uh, 46 and a half and 48 degrees uh, uh, centigrade, that when you put it on your skin, it's a burning hot sensation. And 42 and 44 are just warm. And the people that are feeling a very high empathetic state, they experience their pain, but not the non, not the non pain. But the, the pain is stronger than the people who are in um, the non empathetic state. So it suggests that having feel, feeling empathy yourself can put you in kind of a primed state uh, for experiencing pain more more strongly than you would uh, if you weren't. So. I don't know how that, what that says about having, you know, being a healthcare professional or, but, you know, it's, anyway, it's what it is. <laughs> okay, so I just want to kind of shift gears a bit now because I think it's important that 
over the last few years, we've, we've started to see, again, through these same brain imaging techniques, that there are long-term effects of, um, of, of pain, of being in chronic pain on, the, on, on people's brains. The reason I have this is, this is Frida Kahlo, who is a, um, a Mexican artist, and this is a self-portrait. She was in a, a bus accident when she was a young woman, and she suffered from pain and depression for the rest of her life because of it. And this is her drawing of her own pain. And what I love about it is that pain, you know, pain patients come in pain clinics and they say, it feels like somebody's driving a nail through my, my arm. And people who haven't experienced, like this is like neuropathic pain, there's various types of pain that, that Mark Ware will talk to you about. If you haven't experienced it yourself, it's hard to understand. They think that, that these people are just talking metaphorically, but actually if you do animal studies and you record from neurons uh, with animals in the same situation, what we're, and also when we're doing brain imaging in, the, in our pain patients, your brain is actually telling you that it feels like um, nails are being driven in your skin. So when it gets, so it may not be happening here, but it's happening here. And so it's not just speaking metaphorically, it's really describing what people really feel. So brain structure. So you know, with MRIs, I say we can show brain structure, and we can also show activations in the brain. And for, unfortunately for all us old people, uh, as we get older, we start, your, your, your brain is made up of gray matter and white matter, and gray matter is where the neuron cell bodies reside, and white matter is where a lot of the connections are. And the gray matter starts thinning out. It gets smaller as you get older, suggesting you may be losing some neurons or you may, may be losing some, some connectivity between neurons. Uh, so we get, we have, our brain starts shrinking just like our bodies. <laughs> and, but for chronic pain patients, uh, they're, um, what did I say here? I kind of jumped, uh, that, that kind of jumped ahead here, okay. Um, well, that, I'll show you some of these changes that are happening in the gray matter, but that the chronic pain patients, some of these changes are mainly happening in areas that I showed you earlier that we know are important for pain modulation, for modulating the pain. So I'll show you some of these changes. So one of the most, the most pro uh, prominent things that we see is that gray matter decreases, uh, uh, that there are de you have less gray matter in a chronic pain patient than in a healthy person uh, when you control for age and other factors. Uh, so here's a, here's a, a study that was done by, by Van Yap Karin and his group. So they showed total gray matter, the total gray matter in the brain, and they showed it for the control subjects. And then they had two groups of back pain patients. They had back pain patients that, whose back pain was really kind of localized in the back. And then they had other back pain patients where it looked like there was nerve damage in, uh, involved because the pain then radiated down into the legs as well as being in the back. And the, the control subjects had the most gray matter, followed by the, the people with the more restricted back pain uh, and the least gray matter in the pa pain patients that had uh, the larger, both the neuropathic in involvement in the pain. But it's not all over the brain. The, areas, some, the area that had the biggest de decrease in the gray matter is this area, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the same, oops, Oh, I should have had another thought. The same area that I talked about that was very important for this descending modulatory system right here, this one right here. So now these studies have been done that was with chronic back pain patients, been done with all different types of chronic pain. Here's an example with chronic tension type headache where we get some of these same changes. Uh, uh, fibromyalgia patients have some of these same similar changes. So, and uh, we, we're seeing that with, with um, arthri arthritis pain, all different types of chronic pain. So it does seem that there is a kind of an accelerated loss, and I didn't put a, I didn't put a, a picture in here, but, but uh, uh, that this age-related loss of gray matter seems to be accelerated in chronic pain patients. 
So the question is, is this of any import? Is it, does it matter if you're losing some gray matter? And it does seem that there is, there seem to be some consequence. There seem to be a relationship between these changes in gray matter and some perceptual or behavioral measures. So I'll show you some chronic pain patients. Uh, it's been shown in, in back pain patients and fibromyalgia patients, fibromyalgia, which is a chronic widespread pain condition, that the patients compa complain of memory loss, of kind of not being able to think as clearly, with the, and fibromyalgia patients call it fibro fog. Uh, and so, but when you do classical cognitive testing, memory tests, and, and um, uh, ability to perform mathematical tasks and various things, you do find that particularly in tasks that involve memory in the face of a distraction uh, that chronic pain patients don't do as well. And this is one of these tests, the ACT test, where we found it's not a huge effect, but the fibromyalgia patients uh, don't perform as well as the control subjects. And what we find is if we look at the amount of gray matter in the brain, here, and this is the very front, the way this, this is actually the front part of the brain up here, and this uh, blue shows where there's decreased thickness of the cortex in the, in the fibromyalgia patients compared to the healthy people, and you find there's a nice relationship between the amount of that cortex and their performance on this, this memory task. So it suggests that, the, that um, this change in the gray matter that's related to their um, pain condition could is also uh, could be at least correlates with changes in their in their cognitive ability now on the good side there's now been a few studies where uh, you know many chronic pain conditions people just they, they never they have it you know or it just goes on and there's no, no treatment but in many in other cases more fortunate people can receive a treatment after they've had pain for a long time that, in fact, eliminates their pain. And so there are some people that have lived with back pain for many years, and for one reason or another, it hasn't been treated, and then they have a surgical intervention or a treatment that, in fact, eliminates their pain after they've had it for many, many years. And a lot of people do that. They, you limp along with your bad hip for you know, 10 years before you finally decide to have your hip replacement, and so you've had this chronic pain condition. Then you have a procedure that eliminates the pain, and when you do that, Again, the, the new evidence is suggesting that these changes in the brain that we see with the chronic pain seem to reverse themselves, which means that we probably really haven't lost neurons, but you've just probably lost some, some connectivity, some, I can't get into the whole aspect of neurons, but the arborization of the dendrites or things, so that there's something that is reversible. And so here's an example here with back pain patients. So this glob right here is, is again, the same dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, that is decreased with, uh, uh, in chronic pain patients. And so pre, and this is how thick it is pre-surgically versus post-surgically. So you see for everybody but two patients, after, they, they had, after surgery, that area got thicker again. And it turned out that these two patients where it didn't, actually did not have successful surgery. Their pain was not relieved. So for everybody whose pain was relieved, uh, there was this reversal of, of, the, of this thinning of that area. So that was a very positive finding. And even nicer that these changes that we see uh, across a very different parts of the brain, this, this increase in the size of the cortex, related to, to uh, changes in their pain intensity. The, the, the more pain relief they have, the more it thickens, and also in their disability scores, the less disability they have, the more it thickens. So it all seems to go very well that, that your brain starts to normalize along with your um, pain relief. So I just want to finally, one thing that we've done, we've been looking at really, uh, recently and that other people have been looking at uh, are these various kind of lifestyle things like meditation or yoga. We've been studying yoga in our lab. There's been several other labs that have looked at meditation uh, and even just other forms of exercise. We basically find that these lifestyles, positive lifestyles, can affect both your pain experience and the, the anatomy of your brain. So here's an example that with yoga that we had people that had been studied, they were just, they were not like, like uh, 
um, monks that were off at a, you know, in, the, in the mountains. So they're just like normal people that practice yoga on a regular basis and if they, that had practiced for at least six years. And then we did a pain tolerance test where they had to dip their hand in freezing cold water for, and see how long they could keep it in. And the um, yogis, the people who practice yoga, you could see could keep it in much, much longer than the, uh, the control subjects. And then if we looked at their brain, we found this is the total gray matter in their brain that they have the, 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 yoga, the, the yoga practitioners. And these people were, were matched for age, education, sex, all sorts of other, and exercise other than yoga, all sorts of other things that could affect your brain. And, uh, and you found that they had more gray matter than the control subjects. And there was a nice relationship between the, their pain tolerance and how much gray matter uh, there was. And there was a nice relationship between how much yoga they practiced and how much gray matter there was in their brain. So it looked like, you know, it looks like, and I've got more, much more detailed data where we, we are, we're just seeing it's very profound, both in the gray matter and the white matter of the brain, that just the simple lifestyle, positive lifestyle uh, behaviors can have a very positive effect on your pain and on your brain. So I'm just going to give you my take home messages here. Psychological state can have a profound effect on pain perception and associated brain activations. Placebo analgesia is not imaginary and involves uh, release of opiates and dopamine in the brain. Empathy in a caregiver can have a negative effect on his or own, her, her own pain perception. Long-term pain can alter brain structure and associated cognitive function, but these changes can be reversed. And a positive lifestyle can help reduce pain and reverse changes in the brain. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Thank you. OK. And now the questions begin. <laughs> Is the placebo modification of brain pain imaging the same whether or not the subject is aware that the intervention is a placebo? Kind of interesting question. Okay, well, they're not aware that they're getting a placebo. That, that, that's the, the whole effort is to try to make them not aware. So they would, we, um, and what frequently, it's, in, to, to create this placebo, what, what you do is, is like for example, in our lab, we were doing something with a, a cream and we injected hypertonic saline into a muscle to get like a muscle ache. And then you put, the, you know, we said, well, this is like a new topical pain medication that we're trying out. And, and, uh, and so we had the, the, the cream that was supposed to be the real thing. And we had the person, you know, who had to wear gloves and, uh, the, you know, who was putting it on. And then we had a control cream that we told them was just a control cream. Uh, and then, we, then you even do a conditioning uh, a uh, time where you can, like if we're using uh, a, like a hypertonic saline, we can change how, how ch change the concentration of it. And so they think, oh yeah, that worked really well. So you can actually then condition them. So we have, you have to go through these elaborate ruses, but they can't be aware. If they're aware, then uh, it's not gonna be a placebo. <laughs> well, except for the, unless you do conditioning. Yeah. Uh, why do some people say their pain is worse at night? Well, it depends on the kind of pain, and I'm not an MD, so, you know. But, I mean, a lot of inflammatory pain, where you're not, if you have inflammatory pain from arthritis and various things, if you're not moving around, um, it can be, um, uh, the inflammation doesn't get broken up. So it could just be a peripheral effect like that. You know, or if you've been sitting a long time and you get up and then it hurts more. So that's one reason at night. But there's also, a whole thing about pain and sleep that I don't know a whole lot about, about but Gilles Levine at the University of Montreal studies, and that there, during parts of your sleep cycles, your pain is quite inhibited, but not in other parts of your sleep cycles. So uh, there, it's a complex relationship between pain and sleep. So I think there's more going on than just what's happening in the periphery, um, but I can't tell you much more about in the brain. There's not a, not, not a whole lot about what's happening in the brain related to sleep. But, but um, interested minds want to know, so how does depression and insomnia affect pain perception? Well, this is interesting because it's a vicious cycle. Uh, you can have pain can lead to depression, uh, 
which then exacerbates the pain, or you can start with depression, which leads to pain, which, which exacerbates the, uh, um, the, the depression, and then insomnia, again, if you're not sleeping, then you, that will enhance your pain as well. So all three together becomes quite a vicious cycle. And there's been kind of dispute about you know, the, 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 uh, the chicken and the egg about this, but, it's, but they're good data. We've done animal studies where you create a, a, a pain condition, and then months later, the animal starts exhibiting depression-like behavior. So we know it starts with the pain, and after they've had pain for a long time, then they get the depression. But then you can start with the depression and then get pain. So I think it really does work both ways. Unfortunately, in most cases, it all starts mingling together and becomes a vicious cycle that you need to find ways to break uh, because then they, you know, they all exacerbate each other. This, this is, I've, I've wondered as I've done many signs for many years and the quality of handwriting, I sometimes attribute it, I, I, uh, I'm sorry to say, to whether it's a man or a woman. And this, as I read this, it explains it to me and it was what I thought. Uh, <laughs> can you explain why women have a different pain threshold and tolerance than we men, I think is what it says. <laughs> Not W-E-E -E men, it's W-E men. <laughs> well, I mean, Jeff will talk to you a lot more, but it's absolutely true. Women are more sensitive than men. And, uh, and so when you do experimental pain in a laboratory, women experience, they have lower pain thresholds, they experience it more strongly. Chronic pain conditions, Migraines, you know, are like 70% women. Fibromyalgia, 70% you know, women. Uh, even back pain, which you think maybe, you know, men, they're out there working hard. Uh, even that is, uh, has more women than, than men. So women are much more uh, uh, prone to, to have chronic pain conditions. And so there really is a sex difference. And you find the same thing in other species. It doesn't have to just be human. So it's not your, you know, your psychology is happening in rats and, and mice. And uh, so, uh, but interestingly, it's not just pain. Women tend to be more sensitive uh, to sensory stimuli in general. So it doesn't have to be only pain. So I think they really have a more sensitive sensory capacity than men, which may be the starting point for, many, for much of this. <coughs> So I'm sure no man in the audience has ever been called insensitive. <laughs> Are you familiar? I was looking at my wife when I said that. Are you familiar with? I not. I don't know what this is at all. Autogenics and its effect on pain, and they're recommended a lot in uh, Germany. For what? what Autogenics. I never heard of it before. I don't. I don't know about it either. You have stumped the panel. I know. Sorry. Come on down. <laughs> okay. No, We'll save that one. We'll get that answer by uh, Joe or somebody yeah. on the website since it's a medicinal chemistry question, I think. Okay. Uh, okay, Kathy, do you believe that the gray matter... Is that matter a clarification of the autogenics or something? Like okay, okay. Well, it, okay, I didn't know the terminology, but it sounds somewhat like hypnosis. And we've actually used hypnosis. Like when I started when I did these hip, these studies of hypnosis, I did was totally non-believer. I thought it was just, you know, total junk. And what we found is not so we first of all we found that we get, you know, profound pain relief through hypnotic suggestions when I was working with this this well-known hypnotist and but then when we did our brain imaging studies I was convinced it was because I kept thinking, well, people are just telling you what you're, you know, you give them a suggestion and they're just telling you what you want to hear and they're just trying to be nice. Uh, but in fact, when you did the brain imaging studies, it's a profound way of, of, of accessing these psychological systems. I mean, so for some people, uh, you know, I don't know, autogenic, but these various different ways that you're just tapping in to these intrinsic systems in your, in your brain in a very powerful way. Here's an interesting one, too. Do you think that the gray matter of long-time empathetic caregivers, I guess as opposed hmm. to non, I guess women caregivers, will <laughs> decrease just as it does for uh, chronic pain sufferers? You know, that's a good yeah. study <laughs> I haven't thought of. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I'd like to do that study. <laughs> I mean, actually, you could just, yeah, that, that would be... 
It's interesting because you know, it would be actually quite easy to do, but just kind of, of looking at natural changes with age and with, with empathetic versus non-empathetic people. Now we have the last question uh, as we are running out of time, and this is my question. Um, it just sort of bugged me. Why, why does the gray matter decrease with chronic pain people? Is the brain trying to unwire itself? Why, why does it do that? Well, more that we start looking at these networks in the brain and white, white, white matter connectivity, you are getting disruption in connectivity. Uh, you actually were finding increased connectivity where it shouldn't be and decreased connectivity where it should be. Uh, and so this is, I mean, these, these studies, it's only the last few years, and so we're getting more and more. The technology, you know, started off, we could just look at how much gray matter, white matter. Now we can look at the integrity of the white matter tracks and, and we can look at these intrinsic networks and how they're disrupted. And so it seems that you're getting disruption, you're getting, as I said, connectivity uh, between pain areas into networks of the brain that shouldn't be, like default mode network that should be arresting what's happening in your brain when you're at rest, and now it's being interrupted by the pain and, and being connected uh, in area where, where it shouldn't be. So, yeah, so you're getting, there's a lot going on. Well, with that, let's uh, let's give uh, Catherine a nice farewell. Thank you. Thank you.